over the past two quarters to put together Iranian student group's first ever panel on PACE. We are very excited for this panel and we would like to thank everyone who helped make this event possible. First, we want to thank the Iranian Studies Program for being a major supporter of this event, not only through their sponsor sponsorship, but their interest in the vision behind the panel. We would also like to thank Emma Watson, the Program Director for the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department, for her guidance and assistance these past two quarters. This type of event is a new venture for Iranian Student Group, and Emma really helped us navigate it. Next, we want to thank Dr. Hayat for presenting this idea to ISG and for all of her help along the way. I want to personally thank ISG board, especially Tina and Arman. They created all the flyers in our beautiful program and really were my right hand and helped me with anything I needed. Finally, we want to thank our panelists and our moderator who agreed to be a part of this panel and have been excited as we have for today. So now I want to uh, Welcome our MCs to the stage. Hi everyone, my name is Layla Shagan and I'm the president of ISG at UCLA. Uh, hi, my name is Tala Kogadi and I'm the vice president or the co-vice president of ISG at UCLA. We just wanted to say a little something before we start this exciting panel. Um, as the president, I have the honor of serving all of you and the many people who come to our events um, throughout the year. As Meta or as Nagin said, this is a new venture for us, and hopefully, it's the start of a year full of events just like this, um, where we talk about what it means to be an Iranian, where we talk about it from an academic, a cultural, and educational perspective. I'm excited for the year to come, and I hope all of you are as well. I wanted to thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to us, and it means a lot to the incredible group of people that Netta and Negan work so hard to bring together, um, two of whom I have the pleasure of taking their courses and who are incredible, incredible mentors of mine. Uh, the only other thing I would add is that as an organization, uh, we are explicitly apolitical, and there is a section at the end of this event that is open for Q&A. And that doesn't mean don't ask questions that are inherent to your identity, but when you are asking questions, speak from a position that speaks on your own experience. So when you talk about something, talk from a place of your own experience, share your own background, and then we can talk about um, the question you bring up, which is also the purpose of the, mod of the panelists, is they're going to be sharing their unique experiences with the Iranian diaspora. And we do this if you're wondering why, as a hope to unite the community, and so we don't take any stances in one way or another for the sole purpose of making sure that no one is excluded or isolated in that process. Um, <clears throat> and so now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, a brief bio regarding our wonderful moderator for the evening, Dr. Nushin Badizadeh. Dr. Nushin Badizadeh is a curriculum developer and instructional faculty member at USC's Center for Race and Equity and UCLA's Department of Sociology. Dr. Badizadeh's teaching background in areas of research and expertise include diversity and inclusion and issues of gender and racial equity in education. She has an MBA in finance and is on the advisory board of Peace Over Violence, a social service agency dedicated to the elimination of sexual and domestic violence. Dr. Valizade is a spoken word performer who strongly believes in the power of music and art to promote peace and social change. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Valizade to the stage. Welcome everyone. It is truly an honor for me to stand here and share space with you. Well, I'll be sitting, but to share space with all of you and with our fantastic panelists. Um, I want to also not ignore the fact that a lot is happening in Iran right now and my heart and thoughts are there. Uh, but what a privilege it is to be able to come here and have these kinds of discussions together as a community. I'm very proud of the ISG to be able to pull this panel together. They've been working on it for months. Um, and it's really, the set, it's going to center on peace and on navigating the Iranian identity, the Iranian American identity in this diaspora. Um, and really, I hope that through our differences and through our unity, we are going to be able to grow, grow closer together, and really come from a place where we are working towards peace and solidarity. Uh, 
The majority of the, well, this entire discussion will be held in English along with the Q&A, and that's to be inclusive of our non-Iranians non who are here and our Iranian-Americans who do not speak Persian. But before I sit down, I do want to share one line. Uh, it's a quote for, of a beautiful poem by Hafiz. So translated, that is, plant the tree of friendship and it will bear fruits of the heart's desire. I hope that will set the tone for this evening. And with that, I am excited to uh, introduce all of our panelists. Okay, so to my right, first we have Dr. Farid Polokui. He is a licensed clinical psychologist with a private practice in Beverly Hills. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from UCLA and his master's and PhD in clinical psych from Align International University. He's the host of the talk show In Session with Dr. Farid Polokui on Radio Hamra. Please let's give him a round of applause. Next to him we have Dr. Nader Saidi. He was born in Tehran. He holds a master's in economics from Pahlavi University in Shiraz and a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin. In 2013, he became the Tasnimi Foundation Professor of Baha'i Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. Another Dr. Nusheen, which is very exciting. <laughs> Dr. Nusheen Jahan Giri chose to be a doctor and she was inspired by the role of the physicians in the community. She finished her medical training at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and attended the residency program at Kern Medical Center in Bakersfield. She's been with Kaiser Permanente since 2011. Additionally, she's part of the California Zoroastrian Center Core Education Group. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Benjamin Rad is a lecturer of Global Studies, International and Area Studies and Political Science in the UCLA College. Dr. Rad is an expert on government and politics in the Middle East, particularly Iran and US foreign policy. He is currently a research fellow with the UCLA Center for Middle East Development and he is a member of the UCLA International Institute. <laughs> Um, the first question I really want to ask is really about what it means to be Iranian. So it's not necessarily a single identity. It can absorb multiple identities. There's a lot of diversity within our groups, diversity in religion, diversity in ethnic groups, uh, race, uh, all kinds of things. So um, I would like to just briefly hear from everyone how you identify and if there are other communities you're affiliated with. For example, for me, I'm a first generation Iranian American woman. Uh, born and raised in the United States. I don't have, I didn't grow up with a religious affiliation. My family's all from Tehran, uh, Tehran, you know. So that's kind of where I stand, but I would love to hear from everyone else. Um, I'm also Iranian American. I'm an Iranian American, um, first generation in the United States. Uh, also identify as a human being, part of the human race. And part of what I think is important to talk about today when we are discussing unifying within the Iranian community, but then once we have that unity, of course, it's also with the outside community as well. And so uh, I think it's wonderful to have groups like the Iranian student group where people of Iranian backgrounds can learn more about their culture, connect with other Iranians. However, I think the overall goal should be that we understand about our own culture, our own heritage, and we can appreciate that and we can be proud of that. But what the problem is, is a lot of times when we think about our heritage or our backgrounds, we use it as a way to put ourselves above other people. So we'll say, because of my background, this makes me better than you or other people. And Iranians are very proud of our heritage and we'll say so. We have these poets and you know this type of civilization, whatever else. And because of that, makes us. Better than, uh, I'm going to blame Netta for this. She told me she was in charge of the mics. I still right there. Uh, so that's where I think the problem lies. And so we can appreciate and love our culture and our heritage, and I think that's beautiful. 
but to me, it's similar to how we love a child. And when you love your child, you do recognize the unique beauty that each child has, and you can love that, but you don't put your child above another child. So similarly, we can appreciate and love our past, we can love our futures in that same way. And so I think what we should try to do is strive to achieve that unity within the Iranian community, but I hope we can then serve as a beacon of unity and hope for the whole world, that we don't think now that we see ourselves as this group, we are somehow better or different than others. The question is uh, what, who I am and what is my identity. Uh, my identity is defined by my history, really. And uh, <clears throat> so at different moments uh, in my life, I have identified myself in a different fashion. Uh, I come from a, of course, I was born in Tehran. I studied in Shiraz. I come from a background that half of them are Baha'i, half of them are Muslim. Uh, I uh, have been interested in philosophy from very young age, and for that reason, I have studied religion, philosophy, relations of these things. So I have been uh, uh, a spiritual being in my definition. I have been an atheist for a long time, a Marxist for a long time, uh, a Baha'i. Um, and uh, I identify myself uh, with the reality of, of, of human experience. And I think that is um, a very important point for, for our discussion. So if I wanted to actually, um, so I'm, I'm actually um, born in a Zoroastrian family. I'm the first generation Iranian American here. And um, if I want to call myself, as far as culture goes, I was debating myself as far as am I American, am I Iranian? But when I go inside, I'm totally Iranian. I had some difficulty to accept how much I can stay American, but I'm connecting to it when time goes by because I think it's a relationship that um, we have, the identity actually, the cultural identity I think starts from the beginning of our lives and we are born, and our family, our environment, our you know, um, country we're coming from has a big impact on it. So, um, and when I came here, I was completely kind of reformed in that regards. So I'm trying my best to understand the culture here and kind of find that aspect of my own identity, but I think it takes time. So, uh, my story, I was born in Shiraz and I moved here in 1979 at the peak of the revolution and it was a period, my family, we moved to Santa Monica and I grew up in Santa Monica at a time when my school, whatever school I was in, uh, elementary, middle school, I could count on one hand the number of Persians that were there as students. And it's changed a lot, but what it taught me was that I didn't have a place for many years. I didn't know what community I belonged to. I didn't know whether I wanted to assimilate rapidly or slowly, what part of my identity and culture I wanted to hold on to, and what I needed to let go in order to become more like everybody else. So it's a journey. It's a journey I'm still on. It is amazing to see the turnout here tonight uh, because it reaffirms, I think, what we all do have in common. And it's something that um, I would have benefited from 30 years ago, but it's never too late. And so, like I said, the journey for me is still ongoing. But I do want to make a distinction between Iranianness and Persianness, right? One is a nationality, and one is a ethnic cultural connection. And for me, the Persian identity that represents the cultural aspects of everything that Shiraz is known for, everything that other parts of the country are known for. That is the part that I celebrate today more than uh, anything else. So uh, anyway, I look forward to the rest of the evening. So I'd like to know a couple of you might want to share a little bit about some issues that seem to divide Iranians from one another. Um, I know there was some mention that, uh, about how Iranians can seem to use 
their cultural identity or their perspective to one-up someone, but what are some real underlying issues that divide us and what can we do to help mediate and address that? Anyone? Well, um, I'm gonna have mic issues the whole night, I think. <laughs> I think this one's Switch it off. Sure. This one's off, I think. It is, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll see how this goes. But uh, I think our culture, Iranians in general, maybe I just want to use Iranians in general are very hierarchical. We care a lot about status. And it makes sense, especially in our history, when people marry. Of course, I'm sure any of you in this room, if you wanted to tell your parents about a guy or a girl, the first thing they would say is, who's their family, right? Even now, when things have changed so much. And so we care a lot about the background and saying that's going to define who we are. That's going to put us above or below other people. And I think unfortunately we carry with us this hierarchical mindset that we have to somehow figure out who's better, who's worse. I'm definitely worse with the mic. So who's better, who's worse, and we, we focused a lot of this. So within our community you see a lot of division, unfortunately, from religious uh, demands, I'm causing a lot of trouble, I'm sorry. Um, from religious ways to cultural ways, given which city you are from, of course, we see this you know, happening a lot. And I think recognizing that us versus them, this mindset is, in some ways we can say humans have this. We do have a us versus them preference, and this can make people feel like, oh, this is horrible. If we feel us versus them, then what, what, can, we, what can we do? We're gonna divide and we're gonna not like each other. The good news is us and them can be defined differently, even in a given time, but especially over time. So who you consider a them can change based on how you interact with people, how you view people, how you view the world. So right now they're having the BSC uh, rally down there. Right now we're uh, SC, we hate USC, we're so anti-USC. And I remember going to UCLA and I would see a red sweater and I had a reaction to it. <laughs> That's just a funny story. I did my first practicum working with students at USC, and so they'd walk into the room with these bright red USC sweaters, and I had a hard time building empathy with them. <laughs> they don't like, thank you. Keep it like this, okay. So, um, the us versus them could change, but if you saw someone in a USC sweatshirt while you were in, let's say, some other country where you didn't speak the language, right? It's us, it's someone from America, it's someone from Los Angeles, let me go talk to them, they can help me figure out my way around here. So there is this tendency to have a us and them, but the good news is we can actively work to change who we consider a them. And I think it is possible for us to shift that over time as we think and interact with others to make that include the whole world, even all living beings can become your the us, it doesn't have to be a them. And so that's important for us to recognize we project sometimes our own otherness or weakness onto others to somehow think they're less than us, but that's just a defense. Really, we are all equal, and we can achieve that mindset. Anyone else would like to speak on that? I think, the, I mean, addressing that question to a large extent is addressing the entire topic of, of, of this uh, session. Uh, so, I'm not going to directly answer that, but I think it's, it is useful as a sort of background to have some sociological understanding of the characteristics of the population that you're talking about, namely Iranians who are in America and of course who are in Los Angeles. I'll say a few words about that if, uh, if that is okay. Uh, Iranians uh, in uh, Los Angeles uh, are different from Iranians in America. Uh, is, uh, of course, is the concentration of the Iranians here, and therefore a subculture has been created with particular social institutions, political institutions, and so on. For most Iranians in America, you, you know, there exists uh, no such uh, similar condition. So it is unique Iranians in Los Angeles. But Iranian Americans in general are also very different from other ethnic groups or national groups who are migrants, immigrants to the United States in a variety of ways. The first characteristic is that the Iranian Americans are very young as a community in the United States. Uh, and so they are developing uh, and perhaps there are very much more confusion in terms of the questions of identity. Um, the other thing uh, is that this uh, particular population that we're talking about is uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, 
uh, successful educationally, occupationally, uh, income-wise uh, group in the United States. So it is an immigrant community, but it is not a typical immigrant community that is you know, beginning from zero and is under very difficult uh, in terms of socioeconomic status and attainment and so on. It's uh, really uh, the lowest possible categories and so on, and it will have its particular conditions and so on. It is a very ironic situation that Iranian Americans, in terms of educational attainment, occupational attainment, and so on, are among the most highest, perhaps really the highest category in the United States, which <laughs> gives it a particular characteristic. A, a final element I, I mentioned, the Iranian Americans in the uh, uh, US are different from most other ethnic immigrants in the sense that they are not only immigrants, but they are in exile. They perceive themselves as being in exile. Exile means that they are forced to leave their country. And a lot of people came to the United States to study before revolution. So they would not be part of this category. But most immigrants, most Iranians who are at, uh, in, in this country, they came after the revolution. And because they felt that uh, they can't have rights in their country or opportunities in their country, and so they felt that they, uh, out of persecution or, or lack of opportunities and so on, they felt that they are forced out. But at the same time, to be exiled, it means that they have chosen to come to the United States and looking at the United States as a land of opportunity. So the concept of exile, I mean, this defines a particular paradoxical situation for all Iranians. On the one hand, there is a sense of homelessness and depression and nostalgia because they are forced out. They feel they are in alienation and exile. On the other hand, there is a sense of euphoria about United States and the new culture and the opportunities and so on, which contrasts with their home. And this creates subcultures and sub-identities. Maybe some people are just completely in nostalgia and tragicness and they feel that they are suspended between heaven and earth because they have no place. They're they are outside of their home. They don't relate to the US. US is just a foreign place and so on. And some people, on the contrary, they become completely infatuated with the West, forget Iran and their, their identity. And the, some, um, they still live in Iran, but they make that a euphoric experience. Maybe they are not much relating to the United States, America, the, the host country, but they create a new Iran within Los Angeles. And, mm -hmm. and the culture is the culture of disco, the culture of shopping, the culture of consumption, and things like that. They are happy. Um, and so we have, and then we have people which are combinations of these things. Uh, I just wanted to mention briefly this as a sociological background for understanding the question of identity of Iranians here. Thank you. That was excellent. And so, since you have been able to really kind of talk about the differences in the subcultures, I want to also hear if there's a difference between what the difference, we know there are differences between the older generation and the younger, but what are some differences between the older generation, the younger generation, and also those who have immigrated from Iran and those who are the children of immigrants? So, okay, so um, I want to actually to bring this up as my own family. So I can give you an example for my, um, what I have experienced. And uh, this has actually happened when my father came in a few years back when he was in the 70s. And he, he doesn't know any English. So he had actually a big struggle how he can settle in here. So um, how he found, actually he's in LA, so as, um, he actually very good explained. So he could communicate, the only communication he could make was, made was uh, with the Iranian community. So he was like in his own circle of Iranian population here. But I myself, I'm very grateful for that because we have a good community here and he actually can settle in. 
But then um, if you ask him if he is American, he for sure he says no, because he's completely Iranian. He cannot even connect and communicate with anybody here who speaks English. So then you, actually then the next person would be me, which I came here when I was in my 30s. So for me, it's different because now I know how to communicate and learn a little bit more and connect. And so, but as I mentioned, I still have my own um, culture in myself, the way I was connected to my homeland. So I cannot kind of give it up easily. Then you come to my kids, which I have two kids, and then I came to US, they were two and four. So I started like with my, you know, the big, um, um, you know, energy that I had inside me to just keep them talk Farsi, learn Farsi, stay Iranian. But then when my daughter got to her fourth grade, gradually I found out, oh my God, she's not talking Farsi anymore. She stopped. And then I was trying myself, what I did wrong? Did I, I forced her, maybe I did something wrong, but it wasn't me. Later on, I realized that for them to be able, this young generation to be able to match themselves in the, at school, they try their best to um, find common points. Otherwise, they won't be uh, accepted by their schoolmates. So that was the big reason for her to stop. And then, um, but I didn't stop. I continued kind of doing what I supposed to do. As far as cultural education goes, I kind of took them to our small but um, kind of strong Russian community that I had. So I gave them as much as I could to keep them in touch with my culture, my religion, even though I was doubtful. But now when they grew up and they are older, I see they fit what I did. So they came back. So what I think is, and this is very important when we come to this country and our identity kind of forms around the time we come in, but as our families, as our being um, like the mom, being a mom and dad, being a family, being a, a teacher, we have a big role in the community to not to lose the game. We should stay there and emphasize on our values and moving forward. Thank you. especially when you are an immigrant in a new society that is very foreign. The challenge of being part of a tribal culture is what do you do when you enter into a pluralistic society like we have in the United States? And so we make a choice. We make a choice in terms of how we um, identify ourselves. So for example, those of us that live here, are we in Los Angeles or are we also of Los Angeles? And the difference is between the in and the of is have we embedded ourselves in the culture, institutions, and civil society in the city or whatever part of California or the United States we're from? Or have we retained or remained behind our tribal walls? And I think a lot of the division that we see, both within each gener each within one generation but multiple generations, is those who struggle to not just be in LA or in California, but also of the city and of its culture to the extent that we do integrate ourselves and try to connect and uh, empathize with those who are not Iranian, those who are not Middle Eastern, those who are extremely quote unquote foreign to what we're used to. So I think those divisions and that decision, whether we choose to break out of our, what many call a bubble, and to assimilate and acclimate, do we make that choice? Or do we say, I'm happy within the community that I am, I don't feel the need to go beyond it. I don't really see any reason I need to do that. I can live my entire life within this tribe and I'll be fine. And you will be fine, there's no question about it. But there are other Iranian Americans who make a decision, uh, oftentimes not an easy one, to break through that tribal restriction and become part of the broader American culture. Um, that is a struggle that I've gone through, that I still face and I still think about a lot. And it's something that I see with um, every generation that I, that I teach or, or that I uh, come across. Thank you for that. <laughs> Can you comment before we move on?
thoughts and shift gears, and I want to kind of hear from, from anyone. Um, especially with the comments by Dr. Saidi that LA is a different kind of uh, culture of Iranians. I've noticed that myself. I grew up in Boston, there were very few of us. We didn't ask, you know, what religion were you? It's where are you from? We're just like, you're running, we're all friends, we're all family, we're everything. And then I moved here and it was very, there's so many people and there's so many Iranians, it's very, suddenly it matters, you know, what part of Iran you're from, where, which city you live in, if you're from the Valley, if you're from OC, if you're from Beverly Hills. <laughs> and then I, I actually, you know, teach here. I have a lot of Iranian students, um, some who are here. And, um, and, and I've actually been able to hear from, from a few that there, it's, it's even segregated at times within the college campus. So are there any recommendations for how we can actually come together when you have so many groups and it's so easy to just go to what you're used to and what you're comfortable with? Maybe it's even those who speak great Farsi and those who never bother to learn whatever people want to generalize. Um, are there ways that you recommend that we can actually work together towards peace and towards unity and really be considerate of each other's differences in religion, in ethnic backgrounds, in mixes. Anyone have anything to share with that or experience? Um, I, I, well, it's a big question. I think that's, in a way, what we're looking at tonight is how do we, how do, we do that? And I think there's no one simple answer. Uh, I did allude for to the mindset of how we, we view that. But even what you were saying was interesting. You were saying where you were in, in Boston, there wasn't this asking, and sometimes that's almost a luxury we have in Los Angeles because there's so many. If you go somewhere and there's two Iranians, you're gonna say, okay, we're the Iranian group, you're not gonna differentiate. But then when you have thousands, all of a sudden groups can form. So it's a good and a bad thing. Uh, but I think also Dr. Rod alluded to this as well, that it cannot be understandable the comfort we have of being with people who we find similar to us. Or if you are an Iranian, to listen to Iranian music or watch Iranian television, where if you listen to English music, American music, American TV, you might learn the language. We can understand someone wanting that comfort, but I think we do have to step out of that comfort zone, as cliche and easy as it sounds, to, to assimilate or to, to get used to other things, but do that also with other people. We have to interact with one another, and that's something that people see, and all the research shows us, yes, we can have this us versus them, but when you interact very closely over a long period of time with anyone or any group, they cease to become a them. They become us because you see the humanity in them. You see that they're human just like you. So I think we have to be aware sometimes, yes, you might want to be with people from your own religious background, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that you should never see them. But be mindful of not just making that your only group, so having that be your sole identity, and be mindful of being an Iranian and then being a human and connecting with everyone. Anyone else want to share on this? Um, I think part of the challenge is uh, trying to build unity and cohesiveness in a time where the broader American um, culture is going through massive division. Um, I, you know, forgive me, so I teach political science, so if I get political for a moment, but the last two weeks have seen these hearings in the U.S. Congress having to do with um, the possible impeachment of a president. We see divisions on a broad scale in the United States where half of the country not just disagrees with the other half, but actually despises them, demonizes them. So in this environment, we're talking about now trying to find unity. So if on a broader national level, unity can't be found, it becomes very difficult then to see how any group can do that. So human nature predisposes itself to tribalism, even in the United States, even if you're not from the Middle East. So the challenge is gonna be, can we do this while the rest of the country is fighting itself? While, you know, while this polarization takes place on a much larger scale, can we avoid taking sides in that debate and can we find commonality? And you know, the answer to that is yes, it's dual, but it requires overcoming tremendous amounts of biases that are built in um, and breaking through that. And it, and, it, and it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of blind faith. And that is, I think, events like tonight that bring people together of different views, um, uh, and I mentioned this to Leo, we've been putting this together, I think it's amazing. I think events like this and programs like this are one way that we can do that. But understand that we are fighting and going uphill um, and, and trying to do this while the rest of the country is demonstrating the opposite, that division is now the way things are gonna be. So um, 
I admire and hope that we can do this, understanding the limitations of what we're going up against. Incredible. Absolutely, thank you. And especially really being able to have a group that, while there are plenty of groups that are positioned, to actually have access to a group that won't be positioned, that will be able to hold space for everyone, all different thoughts, that, that, that's something that's important. We can see that also with the arts as well. Um, so one thing I want to kind of share with yes, yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, going back to uh, an issue that I discussed before, I think I, I mentioned about alternative uh, types of uh, this situation of the Iranian, Iranians in exile. Uh, those examples that I mentioned, for me, they are not the perfect solutions. They are not perfect identities. Uh, the perfect identity or the appropriate identity that I suggest is that this, this unique situation that all Iranians uh, in exile are experiencing creates an opportunity, a great opportunity. The opportunity to transcend the limitations of one culture and to embrace a unity in diversity namely to maintain the beautiful elements of Iranian culture and identity, while at the same time to go beyond ethnocentric ideas and aspects of Iranian culture. At the same time to become embracing the beautiful aspects of the culture of the West, in this case the United States, and reject the negative elements of, of that, which would be ultimately contrary to universalistic moral principles. I think this unique opportunity that has been created for all Iranians, this is a historically unique and exceptional opportunity. And if, if, if we take this challenge, then we can be a bridge uh, for varieties of cultures of the world, including Iran, and we can be a factor to help to realize the potentialities which exist in the culture of Iran. Iranian culture and history has had a lot of beautiful things, but also it has a lot of ugly things. Both of them have been part of, I mean, any culture is like that, including Iranian culture. We have had, our, the history of Iran has been history of interaction of different cultures, of different ethnicities. Uh, we had a lot of religious tolerance, but also we have the exact opposite. Religious intolerance, Zoroastrians who have been the original Iranians have been mostly forced to leave in, uh, Iran and most, most of them would go either to India or to other places. Uh, 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 the, the, the whole, by the way, the concept of religion in Iran plays the same role that race plays in the United States. Namely, when people think of identity, the first thing they identify is religion. What is your religion? What is my religion? And immediately it creates wars. It creates alienation among, among the people. That's something that, that, that has, to, has to be worked out. I believe personally that the present situation in the United States, this polarization, this demonization that uh, here it was uh, mentioned, it is really a, a sort of convergence that is happening that the Western societies are forgetting their liberal principles and culture, and they, they are converging and becoming more resembling the worst elements of the terrible societies. Namely, this idea that we are absolutely right about whatever you think, and therefore democracy means nothing. Democracy means that we respect everybody and we are humble about our ideas and therefore we talk with each other in respect and then through voting and so peaceful manners we solve things. In the case of either a religiously fanatic idea that you know the will of God and therefore everybody else is absolutely wrong and any difference means that it has to be with violence, suppressed and all uh, uh, all elements to be destroyed, or a Marxist pers perspective. I was a Marxist myself. A Marxist perspective also is very religious and fanatic. You know that you have discovered the science of history. You know the absolute truth. 
I'm not even know absolute truth what is good, what is bad, what is the interest of the people. I'm sorry, there is no room for democracy. What, what is democracy? What is voting? You know what is good. And democracy and a, an advanced society is based upon the idea that you all become humble and don't think that we, are, uh, we know the absolute truth. United States is moving backward. The West is moving backward. And it is very important that as Iranians, we start to <coughs> learn the good things of the West, even help the West, just as we can help Iran and, and the Middle East to realize its positive potentialities, we can also help here, rather than become passive, you know, copies of the worst things which exist either in, in Iran or or United States. Thank you. So, speaking of Iran and the United States, uh, there have been protests in Iran. Um, word is that it's, they're active in over 70% of the provinces. And we don't know much because the internet has been shut down. Um, what we do know is that in the US, and uh, around the world, the Iranians who uh, have access to the internet outside of Iran have been using their platforms. We've seen a lot of musicians, comedians, I know Monster Brani did, uh, the Persian rapper Arafan has a lot of stuff on his social media just bringing about awareness. So my question is, for those of us who are able to access social media, the internet, discussion boards, things like that, do we have a role, do you feel that we should be spreading the awareness? Because whether or not we agree with what's happening or with which side we want to side with, uh, the exposure isn't necessarily there. And so a lot of it is happening just through social media. Um, are there dangers in that? Are there benefits to it? Is, is this something that you're in line with? Um, are there risks in it? I just want to kind of hear from a few people on, on your thoughts. With... Um, so could you... Restart. Yeah. So, Restart, sorry. Yeah, just a, uh, yeah. So, so basically, I just want to know what you think, thank you, I'll rephrase. What do you think about celebrities using their social media with their multi-million uh, followers and platforms to spread awareness? And is that something that every Iranian American or every American who has access to someone um, for, with, with an Iranian background should be doing? Uh, if we've learned nothing, I guess, in the last eight years, seven years since the Arab Spring movements and afterwards, it's that social movements might be born, but they don't endure based on hashtags, memes, and TikTok clips, right? It takes, it takes a lot more than that. And I think all of these things are great, but it's window dressing. Um, ultimately, what, what's more important is if those of us that have access to resources, those of us, uh, people who have uh, high profiles who can, who can reach tens of thousands or millions of people. I think educating mm -hmm. them on what is going on, uh, we're talking the substance of education now. Yes, I'm speaking as somebody who teaches, but understanding what is the system of government that Iran has. Explain to people, be able to convey to them, here it is a theocratic republic. It proclaims to be a constitutional republic. It's not really that, it claims to have uh, elements of democracy. Here's why those elements aren't actually in practice taking place. I think educating people about the dysfunction is more important than merely essentially putting up forms of symbolic protest because ultimately the symbolic protest is a fact. It, I wish it weren't, but it will not endure. What does endure is knowledge. And uh, so I think things, I think, you know, social media, things of that nature, it's not a substitute for actual knowledge. So I think understanding the system of government, understanding, for example, Iran has a now one unified telecommunication system, the National Information Network, NIN, which was created uh, about five or six years ago, where Iran now consolidates all internet access through one company controlled by the government, and that company will decide when and where to turn it off and on. And so now we know that they're gonna possibly create a VPN, a private network, where certain Iranians and certain political classes can access the internet and everyone else cannot. So let's understand what this means. Let's bring awareness about the lack of equal access to information um, beyond just essentially you know, putting up you know, hashtags and slogans and things of that nature. That's important, but it's not enough. It's not gonna be enduring. So I think understanding what is happening on the actual, um, uh, on the ground, 
And I think uh, educating others will have a much more lasting impact uh, than some of what we've seen. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was definitely a topic that we really can't ignore. And I was like, how do I bring this up? But I feel like you answered it very nicely. I want to also add that in, in addition to what we know or don't know about the protests, we, well, we do, those of us who are educators do know that students uh, in Iran, and or potential students in Iran they, who may or may not be part of the protest, not having access to the internet is making it so they cannot apply or submit their applications for jobs and for graduate schools, for colleges and such. So I want to know what our role is. Is there something that educators should be doing? Should we push, should our stu fellow students who have the privilege of being able to be educated here um, push their universities to extend deadlines? What are your thoughts on that? We're actually seeing, I'm sorry, we're actually seeing that I think now, I know that Princeton, John Hopkins, a few other graduate programs have extended their deadlines, aware of the hardships that Iranians looking to apply are facing. I think putting the similar pressure on uh, university leaders here, or wherever we can, to, and then also at the same time, for the government, for the State Department to change its policy in terms of allowing student visas, allowing more Iranians who want to come to the United States to come, the so-called sort of Muslim ban or um, efforts to restrict visas, immigration visas, uh, education visas, these are all things that need to be changed because these barriers don't help the Iranian people, they don't help Americans either. And I think that's something else that can be done. Thank you. Does anybody else have to add to that? Uh, tyranny is always uh, nurtured by silence and ignorance. And so anything that is happening in any part of the world, and Iran, of course, is very dear to us, um, always information, always making sure that uh, the world knows about it. That is one of the most important elements that can uh, help towards, uh, in the long run, solution of, of, of the problem. But I just wanted also to say that a pattern like this is also very important for, for this purpose. What created the society in which Iran is uh, being governed on the basis of that logic, the ultimate source and cause of the problems, which now it manifests itself in various forms in Iran, is the fact that we Iranians, 40 years ago, we acted on the basis of religious prejudices. Uh, we made politics and religion mix with each other and we try to demonize one group and, and another. In any, in any case, we did not have unity. We did not have unity in diversity. We did not recognize all Iranians as a human being. And therefore, our concept of democracy became Islamization. <coughs> and it doesn't matter what, uh, what these people thought. Uh, it's not a question of this religion or that religion. All religions have beautiful elements and all, all religions can be interpreted in very repressive fashion. But, but the point is that the culture that even our intellectuals promoted was, a, was not a culture of affirmation and embracing and confirmation, recognition of all Iranians. It was a culture that put different Iranians against other Iranians. The source of all problems that we have had was that um, any tyrant who wants to continue to rule would use this same method, demonizing various parts of Iranian society on the basis of religion, on the basis of politics, ethnicity, and, and the like. In Iran, the dominant one is, of course, religion. If we move towards an alternative way of thinking, create a different culture in which we Iranians, we see each and all of us as brothers and sisters, that we identify Iranianness. We are proud to be Iranian, but to be Iranian means loving every single Iranian. And that means loving all different cultural expressions which exist in Iran, different religions, different ethnicities, different languages, and so on. And so if we develop this new concept, which is a very unique new concept, um, then in the long run also, we are helping to create a, a new vision of, of Iran uh, that, uh, that can be a model for, for the entire world. So this 
to a discourse that, that we have in the long run, in my judgment, is the most important thing that we can do, provided that we take it seriously and act on that basis. Thank you. I would love to add to that as well and say that um, love our own Iranianness, whatever that may be, our own culture, our own accents, our own hair, whatever makes us Iranian, that we love that. Um, okay, I want to kind of shift a little bit since we have been talking a lot about identity and even talking a little about not just not not assimilating, but really becoming more um, united with not just other Iranians but also Americans. So we've seen an increase in mental health awareness in our U.S. society. However, there's still a lot of stigmatization and there's still, uh, it's still very much lacking within cultural groups. Um, in our community, for example, there might be a lot of trauma from family separation, different forms of discrimination. Some may even say that Iranians, between the Muslim ban, between Bijan Reza and Shabai police, may have be systematically discriminated against. And, um, and there's a lot of displacement as well. There was a mention about homelessness feeling that some have. So I wanna know if there's some efforts that are made in our Iranian American community to destigmatize mental health and get help from our communities. Even as an educator here, I've had so many conversations with Iranian American students and with other international students as well who are having anxiety, depression, pressures from this wonderful campus and the academics <laughs> that are involved here. And I just, and, and I've noticed that you know, there, there's still that stigma to, to getting help. So that's, that's, I just kind of wanted to see what efforts are being made and, if, and what we can do within our communities. Um, this is a topic that's, of course, very uh, important to me as a psychologist and also as an Iranian. Uh, and on my radio show, I try to talk about mental health issues. Uh, I'm also very proud of my father, who's talked a lot about mental health issues and made it more okay to talk about the issues we're going through and also to see a mental health professional because there's a huge stigma in general but in the Iranian community we have a very very strong stigma still that's attached to mental illness to uh, going to a therapist of course it means you're crazy it means you have problems if you do go don't let anyone know I've worked with families where I'll see kids and they'll say my mom told me not to tell other kids that I was coming to therapy my mom said to say I was going to a class if my friends asked me why I can't have a play date. So this is heartbreaking because we're suffering uh, because of the stigma. And so I think an argument can almost be made that the stigma we attach to mental illness can cause as much pain as mental illness itself. Because what I imagine is if you broke your arm, but medical issues were considered really negative, you might try to hide that you broke your arm. And so you go around life and you're trying to cover this. Someone gives you a hug and you feel pain, you have to hide it. You maybe stay at home one day because you can't go somewhere and you have to make up excuses. And so on and on. And of course, if you don't treat that arm, it's gonna get worse and worse and won't get better. And I see the same thing when it comes to mental health. And very often when someone is sitting in my couch, in my office, I know that for years they've been dealing with this issue, but not feeling like they should go in because that would prove that something was wrong with them. Something was bad about them. Something made them unlovable, crazy, unmarriable, all the other things they've maybe heard from other people. And this is really heartbreaking. This is about being human. Every person in this room has mental health issues. Every single one of you, me included, I go to therapy myself. I actually make sure to say that as often as I can so people don't have this idea that it's something we shouldn't talk about or be embarrassed to talk about. It should be something good that you go to therapy. You wanna take care of things. Therapy is about self-awareness, about trying to help yourself grow. And I hope we can move past this stigma. And of course it exists in the Persian culture, but even more strongly with men, and this exists in American culture as well, that men should not have vulnerability, weakness, they should not be sad, they should not cry. And so I can't tell you how many times I had a woman in my office who says, you know, we see that they have issues related to the, the marriage, and I say, you know, couples therapy might be a good idea. And they say, well, my husband says, no, you have the problems, you go. I don't need to go talk to anyone to help me get better, right? And I really, it's one of the most common things I see because the men think, and you know, we can blame men, and I, of course, at some level will, but these are cultural things that we do. Anytime we have a cultural stereotype, it's not just, or gender stereotype, it's not just men that are perpetuating, it's men and women, so we have to be aware that we're, we're all doing this. But to me, it's heartbreaking to see that, and I hope we can equate mental health and medical health. And really the line is becoming more and more blurry because any physical ailment you have is gonna affect you emotionally. Every emotional issue you have is gonna affect you physically. And even what those things mean is not so clear. 
we draw these divisions, but they're not so different. So I try to talk about mental health issues, things that are taboo on my show. Suicide is a topic that people shy away from because they think we shouldn't talk about it, but it exists in every culture. And we have to make it okay because taboos just mean people suffer in silence. And we have to try to break those taboos. And so I believe in prevention. So when it comes to mental health, I think we all as families, we have big roles to actually prevent it to happen to our kids. So we have a cultural thing, I think we learn these educational methods as, as a mom and dad from our mom and dads. And so we move forward. We don't have a systematic method to learn it. So what I found out that like we have high expectations being a Iranian mom and dad, we just push our kids to the extent we want a lot from them. So that causes a lot of stress for them. We don't want to know them. We just know ourselves and what we want. So we put our actually pressure on them to get what we want. So I'm a physician. I've been pushing my daughter to be a physician. She doesn't want to be a physician. She's an artist. So if I don't find out that what is, who is my daughter and what she wants, then I'm pushing her to the point that she gets depressed, she gets anxious, and I'm actually leaving her there alone with my expectation, with what she wants, and she doesn't know where to go. So this is also coming from our families. If we don't know how to raise our children in a good way, I think we cause a lot of trauma. Now, what we've been doing in our community, it started actually, we have like religious classes on Sundays. So we kind of um, took that opportunity from our, um, like from our, um, from the mom and dad, and they have a good uh, psychologist there that she comes and teaches our uh, families about how to raise their children. And I think this has had a big impact so we're talking about awareness. It's very important to, I think it's not just all of us, we should stay learning about, I'm still learning, believe me, I'm still learning how to change myself, how to stop talking, how to not judge my daughter, my son, uh, about their actions because we have to choose. We need to them to choose to fail and then start again. If you don't let them to fail, they cannot grow. I think that's something we should start no, just within our culture, like how um, if someone seeks professional help, they, yeah, and I've heard of many instances of being very unfortunate and people said, I didn't even know there was something wrong. Uh, and especially, in, and I saw some of my students looking at me when you were talking about men, because we did a whole segment about masculinity and suicide rates with men and how little uh, we hear of men speaking with other men and normalizing feelings. So men typically have to cope with either through anger or through drugs, self-medicate, and, and, uh, and it can lead to really fatal terms. So I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, this is actually a very dear subject to me as well. I'm, I'm working on a book project on this where I make the case that the most destructive political force in human history, going back to the Old Testament story in Genesis, is shame. And shame, especially when experienced by men, is we have seen nothing but horrible consequences on a political level and on an individual level. Everything from uh, authoritarian, brutal dictators to school shooters comes down to oftentimes society's inability to educate and give usually men, but women as well, the opportunity to not be ashamed to be shamed. In other words, this stigmatism around shame. So what do we do when we experience shame? One of two things. We either hide and withdraw because we're so ashamed or we lash out and we project the shame, we disassociate. And that disassociation leads to demonization, it leads to horrific consequences. And both in Iranian culture, but in broader Western culture, Eastern culture, you name it, we don't have a mechanism that allows men in particular to be told it's okay 
that you didn't succeed at this, or this turned out this way, or that you suffered this rejection, or you suffered this hardship. You were not less of a man because of it. You were not emasculated because of it. And these are all things that are very still taboo subjects we can't touch upon. But until men are allowed to in a healthy way through therapy, which I'm a big believer in also, to process shame and not avoid it and not stigmatize it, this is a problem we're going to have. And I think within our culture, this is extremely relevant, but it exists on multiple levels in multiple cultures, all the way from you know, any of us in this room to the President of the United States or the, the Supreme Leader of Iran. We deal with shame or we don't know how to deal with shame, and the consequence is horrible for everybody. I have one more um, question before we open it up to all of you, and I'm excited to hear your, all of your questions. Um, but one question I'd like to kind of go around and get your response from. So it's a two-part question. So one, what do you think is a great way for you to preserve the Iranian culture in America, whether or not they were able to learn the language, what's a great way they can preserve the culture, and also if you could go back to the younger you, and tell yourself something about community and identity or tolerance, what would it be? Yeah, we can go that way. Um, so the first one was preserving the culture? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, that's a, a tricky question because culture is also a living thing. So it's not one thing. Yes, there's things in our cultural heritage, but culture evolves as well. So the Iranian-American culture or community has created the culture as well, and even in Los Angeles, that culture might be even different from somewhere else. So I think preserving it, yes, we, we teach and we study, and there's uh, educators on the stage with me who are teaching about that heritage and that culture, but I think also it's a unique experience. So for me personally, putting pressure on someone that you have to like your culture, or have to like this, if anything, could push them away. And if we look at cultural development in general and identity, what you usually see is for kids of immigrants, for example, you first are uh, very close to your family, your parents are your everything, they're like gods to you basically, so you love your culture. And I remember being a kid myself and loving the Persian culture, Persian music, all that stuff. But usually around teenage adolescence, they turn towards their peers, uh, and, and that was, you brought that up in, in some ways with your own daughter, they turn towards your peers and they need to, and so we don't want to interfere with that. So I work with a lot of families and they say, how do I keep that Persian culture in my kids all the time, like even in those teenagers, no matter what, because it's so scary to see our kids going away from us in any way, and this is one of those ways we can feel that. When they become less Iranian, we feel like they're becoming less close to us, and so sometimes we cling onto that, and unfortunately in Persian families, we sometimes are too dependent to begin with, so we cling a little bit harder, but we don't want to lose that. But I think we have to let people go through that process on their own, and what I even experienced myself after going through that was in my college years, which maybe a lot of your experiences too, you come back towards it a little bit more. You come back and at least are trying to integrate and find your own identity, which could include more of that Iranian side as well. So to parents, I would say don't put too much pressure and force, make it available to them if they want to learn more and they want to understand more, that's wonderful. But the pressure usually pushes away rather than pushes towards something. So I think that's something to be mindful of. But to myself, I guess related to that, you say, what would I, can you repeat yeah, that one? If, if you could um, go back to the younger you, what would yeah. you tell yourself? About culture specifically, or that's a lot? Is this a therapy <laughs> session? I feel like I... <laughs> I'm not qualified for that. <laughs> well, about culture, I mean, I guess maybe being aware of that, um, whatever, it depends on what age, like I said, there was times where I was very much in it, maybe less, that there's a lot of beauty within that culture and that heritage, and even if right now you don't see it, you might become more aware of it as you get older, which is something I experience. So don't push it away if that's what you're feeling now. Uh, well, for me also, this question is tricky. Uh, the, the real question, I guess, is that uh, what is Iranian culture? I mean, you have to uh, contribute to uh, preservation of this culture. But what is Iranian culture? And that, of course, means what is to be Iranian. Uh, we have a distinction between Persian versus Iranian as well. That, that is related to, uh, to this uh, uh, question uh, uh, as well. And uh, for me, the, uh, one of the important issues regarding this uh, uh, point 
is that we should uh, think for ourselves and therefore decide what is Iranian culture. Um, the way at different stages of Iranian history or any society, um, society, namely the entrepreneurs of hate, uh, these people have selected one aspect of the culture and they define it as the culture of the society. Whether it is, for instance, Shia Islam from the Safavi period up to now has been uh, uh, selected uh, by uh, the dominant groups, uh, those who have the coercive power in Iran, to define this as, as the real Iranian culture. And then, of course, we were uh, deceived uh, to 1960s and 1970s through our intellectuals and through our, through our own ignorance and prejudices that we also thought that this is the real Iran and therefore return to the original Iran and the original culture and tradition of Iran to becoming autonomous and so on means Islamization and Shia clerics to come to, to power. The point is what is the real culture of Iran? The real culture of Iran is diversity of all different expressions. It's not only Persian, although Persian is crucial for Iranian culture, the language and the poetry and the contribution which have been made, but also Turkish is part of Iran. Uh, Arabic is part of Iran. We have Iranians who are speaking Turkish. A lot of Iranian, great Iranian minds have contributed, have written works of genius in philosophy in Arabic, not in Persian. They are also part of Iran. Uh, Baha'i faith is a very important part of Iran. It is the first indigenous expression of understanding modernity, concept of human rights, democracy, separation of church and the state, and so on, in the history of Iran that emerged in the 19th century. That's a very important part of Iranian culture, which all entrepreneurs of, of hate try to suppress that and deny that and exclude that from the realm of consciousness and so on. To preserve culture, we have to also transform the culture. To preserve the culture for me means to recognize the beauty of all Iranians and all the different expressions of, of this culture. So how can we can have peace? I mean, this, this place is discussion of peace. The first thing is to realize that this is Iran. And to love Iran means to love all different expressions of culture that Iran and all Iranians who love them and to identify with all of them. To be Iranian is to identify with all Iranians and understand the humanity of all of them, the sacredness of all of them. And then it means to become curious about all these different expressions, diverse cultures. And in addition to their curiosity, I'm trying to learn about them. So if what, whatever your religion is, or whether you are atheist or not, become curious about different groups, different cultures, different religions. Try to learn, and when you learn, you will find in all of them so many beautiful things. You cannot easily reduce people to, you know, disease and and demonize them and so on. Once you know them, and for this to become real, also you have to go out of the circle of the friends that you have. Associate and interact with all Iranians, with all groups. Go out of your comfort zone to make sure that you have friends who are from a different religion, from, who are from a different ethnic groups and so on. Through interaction, this is a very important, there is a sociologist I love him, Emil Durkheim. This is his whole sociology. Morality, unity, solidarity is created out of interaction, out of common experiences, intensive experiences, and so on. Once we do this, then we, uh, then we can learn about each other, preserve the culture, and not only preserve the culture, uh, realize the beautiful potentialities of Iranian culture, and of course reject everything which has been uh, based upon prejudice and suppression and, and narrow-mindedness and, and, and so on, as uh, Farid, right? As Farid said, cultures are living things. We should not look at them as this dead thing that we have to reproduce exactly everything that everybody has said. So many Iranians have said so many racist things. So many Iranians have said so many ugly things about uh, women and so many other things, so many religious bigotry has been 
We don't want them. We don't want those things. We want the beautiful aspects of it. I mean, actually, this is plenty of the rich Shahnameh, my favorite book in the history of Iran. And it is not well understood by the way. Iranians have distorted Shahnameh to make it a book of Iranian nationalism in the sense of superiority of Iranians against the Turks and against Arabs. Shahnameh has the exact opposite message. Rostam, Rostam, our beloved Fide, is the product, product of a marriage between the grand daughter of Zahar, the ultimate evil in Iran, who was also Arab. <laughs> and of course, the husband of this Mujabe, the husband is uh, uh, one of the heroes of the, of the Persia, Rostam. We can't have more positive figures than Rostam. Rostam is the product of the marriage of this of the grandson, granddaughter of Zahar, of Arab, and Kehosro, the ultimate beautiful figure, the ultimate just king of Iran, is the product of the marriage of Siavash, this, this heroic mystical figure in Iran. And of course, the daughter of Afrasia, the ultimate Turk, the ultimate Turan. Message of Shahnameh is rejection of racism. Message of Shahnameh all over. It's a beautiful book. We have to preserve this kind of Iranian culture. So uh, even the culture, what we do is completely, like it has, they have their roots back. So if you don't know about them, you might kind of feel, what's the point about doing all these things? So it's very important for us to understand what's the root of all these cultures. I think there should be an awareness and actually some education about it if we really want to do that. So we believe in it and then we do it, rather than just like, mimicking it and kind of following forward because otherwise it won't kind of move forward into the community. But um, what I understand is the power of, um, you know, all these common things that we can find. Actually, it has been a question for me. For example, when I celebrate no rules, how many of the other Iranian communities from other religions or other groups, they love to do that? I don't know that. At least it is a question for me. Do we have a common thing that we all can celebrate. Maybe, as um, Dr. Saidi mentioned, maybe uh, uh, poems are something that we can relate all together. Maybe art is one thing. Maybe our, you know, um, uh, food is something we all love about, so we can share that concept. And there is no, I think, uh, sense. There is no sense of I am better than you in that thing, or I'm uh, worse than you. So we can have common, um, and we can share that. But I think, um, so for example, these type of cultural things as I mentioned, I love what I love here. Uh, I actually joined one of the festivals for No Rules years back, and I saw everybody there. They were all partying, and because that's a common point I think we can celebrate. It's just the start of spring. It's not a religious thing, and we, call, we, we all can kind of uh, contribute to that. So I think if you find common points in our culture, there are lots of beautiful things that we can share and um, we can get together about that. Um, so what I'm not teaching, I'm a musician. I am in a band, I perform solo sometimes or I perform with a group. And one of the things I've learned, the beauty of music, 
uh, I've, I've seen this as a performer, but also as a spectator, as a fan, is that nothing unifies a crowd of very disparate, different people than the shared love of music. So for me, it's the lesson I've learned over the years is the unifying power of music and how it transcends socioeconomic, ethnic, religious barriers of many kinds. And we are privileged in that uh, Iranian music is beautiful. And it is classic, it's modern, it's traditional, it's contemporary, it's many things, and it's a fusion of the different musical and cultural uh, influences in the Middle East and beyond. And I think of all the places we could start would be through music. And I think that is something that somebody will always find something that they like. And I think it's a great place to, to sort of begin to form common bonds. Um, and it's something that I, I, if I could sort of go tell my younger self, would be to expo expose myself to as much Iranian music, both modern and traditional, and appreciate its beauty and how it links me to the past, but it keeps also one foot in the present and uh, with my vision towards the future, because that will endure and um, outlive the rest of us. So for me, I think that's, that's a critical point. with what you were saying about our culture, Dr. Saidi, is how we're not originally a racist culture. And even knowing that the first doctrine of human rights <laughs> was written about freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And so really keeping in mind, especially those of you who are students, but in, in this society, we have we are becoming a more and more diverse group than we ever were before. We have Iranians who are part of the LGBT community. We have Iranians who are Asian and Iranian, Black and Iranian, Mexican and Iranian. So we have to, if we can't say, oh, you're just, we just like your Iranian part. We have to be able to come together and understand that as an ethnic minority, which who has diversity within us, we are able to actually cross other boundaries as Americans as well in, in the world. Um, so that's the last thing I want to say before we open it up. I would love to open it up for some Q&A, please. Oh, nice. Who's going to do this? Hello. First, I want to say thank you for speaking to us. I have two questions. One is quick for Dr. Rad. Uh, what do you play and what is the name of your band? And two for Dr. Uh, Dr. Saidi. I was wondering about, you mentioned a, a trauma and a homelessness and a nostalgia. I was wondering if you think that that is something that's passed on generationally, and if so, how long do you think that will transfer on? becomes uh, very much uh, infatuated with the, with the new culture. Uh, the second generation forgets about that culture, wants to forget that language, uh, and internalize the new culture, the host culture, and feels ashamed to be associated with the previous culture. And then the third generation, they sort of return partly, and so they will have a more interactive uh, uh, personality. At least in the past, this was partly correct, but right now we live in a postmodernist culture in which uh, the, the whole uh, intellectual academic culture that we have, the dominant academic culture, in a way constantly reduces identity to these particularistic uh, uh, cultural traditions. And so it, uh, the return to our original culture is very much emphasized and encouraged. And so for that reason, this element, this sequence that I mentioned has, has, has become a little bit no longer 
value, but still it, it, it has some relevance. As well as Iranians, uh, regardless of generation, their basic identity or their basic life uh, agenda is based upon returning to Iran. Uh, then this, uh, the possibility of this nostalgia and homelessness is much stronger. For those who accept the fact that they are in a different place, and this is also home, and they, they love the Iran, but at the same time, they are also Iranian American. Uh, for these people, the, the solution of that nostalgic uh, homelessness, that tragedy, that sense of depression, is much easier. Uh, related to the discussion that we had before, for men of the previous generation, um, about 30 years ago, when a lot of Iranians as exile came to this country, for men it was much more difficult than women. Uh, but that's not the fault of society. Uh, that's the fault of the men themselves. Uh, the Iranian uh, men, who used to be a very important occupational figure in Iran, now has come to, to the US. And so, of course, immediately cannot have those, can, most of them could not speak Persian, so they have to start from zero, more or less. And their ego was so much that this downward mobility, I mean, they have gone in terms of mobility down rather than going up. This downward mobility is so difficult for them, and so, of course, it created that sense of shame as well. But the question of shame, we also have responsibility for, for the question of, question of shame. I saw during these 40 years that I have been here at, uh, in this country that the women usually chose a very different path. And instead of sitting at home and feeling sorry for themselves and constantly saying bad things that, oh, we, you know, we lost uh, everything and, and then look at the US also as this stranger, inferior, culturally bad, evil place, the women started to become active. They started to learn language, they started to work. And even if the, the, the work and the occupation was a difficult one, low in terms of categories and so on, they embraced it, they took the responsibility of the family, a difficult family in that situation and so on. They acted in a positive fashion and uh, I gradually things got, got better. I think the example, Men, in general, also can learn so much, Iranian men can learn so much from Iranian females who acted in a very heroic uh, uh, fashion dealing with this question. Speaking to a panel of four doctors, three PhDs, like there's no question Iranians really emphasize education. Uh, but, like since the day I was born, I just become a doctor, become a lawyer, or don't be my son. You know, it was, it's very rich in a lot of this. But nowadays, they're realizing that what, what is it like 35% of medical doctor students have like depression, alcoholism, suicide rates are going up. Do you think this is something that we should continue to push the next generation? Like this education aspect, or being more open, open to other jobs, other occupations, stuff like that. I can speak on it. I have a five-year-old, and, <laughs> and I will tell you that as soon as she was in my pregnancy, well, as soon as I was pregnant and found out it was a girl, I was like, she's gonna be president. <laughs> so it's in our minds, you know. But I really do actively really try and engage with her um, and teach her about kind of ways she could be entrepreneurial more and ways that she can, whether that means about making money or just really just following a passion and putting a hard work ethic. One thing I do is I rarely tell her she's smart or that was such a great drawing. I, I say, you worked really hard. I saw you work really hard on that. You really like tried. You were, and, and, and try and build her internal, um, 
her intrinsic motivation as opposed to just her wanting to please me and make me happy and have people tell her she's smart, she says she's that. That's what I'm trying to do, but she's five, so we'll see. Um, but I, because of, you know, and, and working in education and working with so many students that I that could come to my office and I'm like, I'm not a therapist, but wow, here we go, you know, and hearing that and hearing and, and thinking and, and, and being able to realize, wow, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Um, that's my perspective. So this is an issue I, I deal with a lot of young adults in my practice, so I see a lot of um, people like many of you who, like you said, there's a pressure. And so it's obviously a complicated question. It's not obviously education is a waste of money and you shouldn't do it, but it's also that not everyone has to have the same path. And so education is an easy metric to say, okay, if someone has a PhD or an MD, they somehow made it or done something right or good. But it's much more complicated than that. What I always tell parents is when you're, when you have a child, and you had your little girl, she's destined to be president, but really what you're given is a seed that you don't know what this seed is supposed to grow into. And all you are supposed to do is to give it the love, nurturing, opportunity, everything it needs to grow into its full potential. But you shouldn't determine that potential and say, it has to become like this flower, it shouldn't look like that tree. You just want to help it become as beautiful as it can become to its fullest potential. And so I think, Yes, it's important. education is not something bad. I think it's wonderful and to all of you in this room. I hope that you do continue to pursue in working hard, as you were saying, rather than saying you're smart. I'm sure you're all smart if you're going to UCLA, but that doesn't mean anything at all. I don't care if you're top of your class in high school, if they always told you you're smart, all of those things. If you don't want to work hard, you won't do much in this world. You have to work hard. And not only should you work hard for yourself, you owe it to this world to become the best you can become. So that could be getting education, because a lot of times if you want to make an impact in certain areas of life, if you don't have that degree, you won't be able to make as much of an impact. There's some ideas I had while I was in graduate school that I might say now, but then now that I see them with so-and-so PhD, people might hear it differently than they did before. So if you are going on that path, I hope you will go all the way, not because you should feel the pressure, not because you're a failure if you don't do it, but because it could allow you to have the best impact in this world, to help people and help the world more by becoming more educated. So that can be the path. But is that the path for everyone? Absolutely not. Um, you can become an artist who maybe studies art as well, but not necessarily have to do that. There's so many things we need. Again, there's so many flowers that cheesy, you know, maybe uh, cheesy alert, but you know, the garden that we have, it's a bunch of different flowers that make it beautiful, right? And so we shouldn't all strive to have one measure. Unfortunately, we often have that in the Persian community where there's, you know, I used to joke that when you apply at UCLA and you put ethnicity, Iranian, it already clicks pre-med, like you don't even have a choice <laughs> to pick your major. So, you know, we shouldn't limit ourselves in those ways. And I hope for parents, they don't feel that. And for individuals, you realize what you were supposed to become is not so neatly defined, but whatever you find that you want to do, work very hard and become the best you can, not just for yourself, but because the world deserves that as well. Uh, can I add one thing? One quick question. First of all, that's a really, really great question. It's a question I get uh, from students a lot. My one sentence response is, spend as much of your time as you can gaining wisdom and not pursuing knowledge. This represents knowledge. In the end, this doesn't matter. It's the wisdom that we accumulate through our lives that matters more. That's, that's my response. Mm -hmm. um, I think this aspect of learning culture is one of the positive aspects of learning culture. Mm -hmm. And I think the rest of America can learn and benefit from this, this model. But at the same time, it is a distorted culture, as it was mentioned in different ways. Before coming to the UCLA for, I don't know, 27 years, I was professor of sociology in Minnesota. And I wrote so many letters of recommendation. Students wanting to go for graduate school and so on. Um, to be honest with you, I don't remember in 27 years if I wrote a letter for any of my students <laughs> for medical school. Um, I wrote maybe one or two letters for law school. Uh, it's now seven years I have been at UCLA, and I have written so many letters of recommendations. <laughs> I hope all of them are for medical school or law school. 
this is a pathological aspect of our culture. Not that law or medicine is not good. It's very, very important. But this compulsive idea that every, everybody should go in these areas, that means that we look at university only as an instrumental idea for making money. And that's wrong. I believe that this is beautiful aspect of Iranian culture emphasizing higher education because higher education is much more than making money. Higher education is a time, it's really a privilege for the people to be able to go to, to university, to colleges. And it is an experience that you, you, anyway, I, I won't continue. <laughs> for being here tonight. I definitely enjoyed my time here and I learned so much. Um, I'd like to give a little background before I ask my question. I'm, I'll make sure it's short. Um, I'm actually coming from Dubai and I had a lot of Arab friends growing up. And um, during the Arab Spring, I would get asked questions like, oh, I know that Iranians are unhappy with what's going on. How is it that nothing is changing in Iran? And of course, that's very inconsiderate to ask because every situation is different, every country is different, and every government is different. But I tried to look into it, and um, the two countries that were able to actually successfully have a revolution, I believe, were Tunisia and Libya. And there was a, there is a big population difference between Tunisia, Libya, and Iran. Iran's a lot bigger, so of course that could be a factor. But also uh, the lack of any leadership or organizational structure in leading the re revolution is another factor. Both the revolutions that happened in the countries were led by some sort of organization. But when we look at Iran, most Persians want a change. Most Iranians want a change, but the fundamentals is different in that change that we want. Some want a return of Shah, some want some other completely different uh, government. So if we are trying to have a change, if we are trying to step forward, how can we start? If we are, the, the fundamental of change that we want is different, how can we unite? And I'd like to add one more thing, is that um, according to my experience with Arabs, I know that um, they usually identify according to their nationality more than other factors. So it's Lebanese versus you know Syrian versus Emirati or whatever. But in Iran, as uh, Dr. Saidi mentioned, we do think of religion um, when we think about identity. And so could uh, putting away the difference in identity be a starting position or should we look at something else? First question having to do with sort of how to bring about change, um, and I'll keep it very short. The, f the very first thing that uh, those of us that want to see any kind of political change in Iran, the very first thing we need to agree on is what system of government do we want? We don't have an agreement on that. We don't have an agreement on even between whether it will be indigenous or western and what those two <coughs> will be. So until we can't agree on that, and that's the dysfunction we still see in the post Arab Spring societies. Until we don't agree on that, we can't have any other discussion about what the next step is. So, um, and, and it, it can be about whether it's a constitutional monarchy or a republic or whatever the case, but we have to have that dialogue and we have to educate on what it means to be, what system of government it is. So that's my response to that. Just a you know, you said something along the lines of, well, why haven't they had a revolution, why haven't they made changes? So I don't know the path and what's the right thing to do, but one thing I brought up for me when you said that is we're very good at judging other people in a situation where we don't know what it's like. So even for right now, I hear a lot of people saying, if I was in Iran, I would be in the streets for sure doing X, Y, and Z thing. And, and you don't really know until your situation. So having, maybe it's a different form of this, but Dr. Said was saying humility, I think sometimes we have to have that humility to not judge someone in some other situation that, oh, if we were in that country, we would do this, or they should have done this by now. And there's some parallels that I think can be drawn for me as a psychologist, even between an abusive relationship, where people say, oh, you know, usually it's the male abuser or the female, it doesn't have to be forced, it happens in all different contexts, but they'll say, well, if she's in that relationship, she must be happy, or it's her own fault, or we blame that they have to 
when really it's much more complicated than that. Uh, it's, so it's very easy from the outside to say you should do this, or it's easy to do this, but I think we have to recognize having that humility with everything, this is a smaller scale, but whatever it is, that we don't know what we would do in another situation, so we shouldn't judge someone else's action. Uh, actually, um, all research has shown that uh, varieties of Arab countries like Jordan, or Egypt, and so on, the percentage of the population who primarily they identify themselves in terms of religion and the Islam is much, much, much higher than the percentage right now in Iran. So as a matter of fact, Iran of the present time is a very different Iran before the Islamic Revolution. Before the Islamic Revolution, Iranians or varieties of reasons primarily identified themselves in terms of religion and that meant Islam, that meant Shia Islam, and the consequence of that was a particular type of revolution which had very difficult uh, consequences. But Iran has changed. Iran right now is really the hope of the entire Middle East. Iran is a place that particularly the younger generation of Iranians are very democratic oriented, very liberal oriented. They want separation of church and the state. They want freedom of religion for everybody. They are not obsessed with the question of religion and, and, and the like. So actually I see Iranians right now as the most progressive uh, people and figures and most politically aware uh, and non-violence oriented. So the romanticization of revolution and coercion, which existed in Iran before the revolution, which is both a Marxist idea and a Shia concept of martyrdom and jihad. The romanticization of violence is gone. And so actually I like Iranians right now and their culture, not the Arab uh, dominant culture. And the Arab spring it failed. It completely failed. Partly because of this too much religious identification. Look at Syria and places like that, what, 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 what is happening. So in any case, Iran has its unique situation. It's not that people don't try. Iran has a situation because of the oil revenue and, and the structure of the system. There is a very powerful, extensive, organized, mobilized, repressive apparatus of state, which regardless of what is happening in the economy because of the oil revenue, this repressive apparatus is constantly, and eff effectively, and efficiently is financed. And the willingness of that to suppress by force and coercion every ex expression of dissent it is more this particular obstacle uh, rather, than, um, rather than unwillingness or, uh, or confusion of, of Iranians. Iranians want democracy, separation of church and state and things like that. Majority of them do, do want that. The problem is this coercive, efficient, effective, organized, mobilized state which has no mercy. Um, hello. Uh, this question is for the whole panel, but specifically for Dr. Saidi. Um, uh, as an Iranian immigrant, I've also spoken to some Iranian Americans who feel a sense of hopelessness who felt a sense of hopelessness over the past few years regarding any sort of social, political, or religious reform in Iran. And I was wondering what your opinion was um, and whether you feel any hope for any change in Iran. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if I'll, I have a few things to say about that. Um, and my students oftentimes will ask me about when democratization and liberalization, if and when it comes to the Middle East. My simple answer to that is that um, what is it that authoritarian regimes fear most? And it is educated, liberal, liberalized women. When you empower women in a society, you will see transformation that you want to see. But in very
it is something that they fear, and they fear immensely. So I think as in what we've seen, the, 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 the progressive growth of, of the modernization in Iran since the White Revolution of 1963 is tremendous. And as women become more empowered and become more liberated, that is when change will happen. So it's a question of, of not if, but when. I actually have a question. Now that I have a microphone, I'm going to utilize my, uh, my time. But um, I think a lot of us kind of take for granted the fact that UCLA, USC, and the universities in Southern California have these powerhouse Iranian studies and Near Eastern studies departments. And that's not something that's very common across the United States to have such access to a panel of educators, professors, people that we take their classes. Um, other professors um, that are Iranian studies classes or Middle Eastern classes. How would you sort of tell those people, those Iranians from Boston or from Wisconsin, how would you direct them as professors, as educators, as uh, leaders to sort of get in touch with that education of Iran? Because for me as a student, I didn't really feel as connected to my identity until I took courses that taught me about my history, that taught me about the history of the nation, um, the culture, the language. So how would you sort of direct individuals who don't have access to those resources to sort of get in touch in that specific way? I'll, I'll start with that. So I have to say representation is everything. I mean, in every culture, when you look up and you see someone who looks like you, even if it's not someone you can physically access, it is everything. We see that, we see it's a role model. It's a role model we cannot necessarily have a conversation with, but who you might look at and say, that could be me one day. And I, while everyone doesn't have the same access to resources, a lot of people will hear they do have access to the internet, they do have access. So one thing I do with my students is I say, you know, what are some of your interests? What are some areas that you actually feel passionate about? And find Iranians who are representative of that. And, and we're everywhere. We're in every industry. The, the new guest supermodel is a friend of mine. She's, she's, uh, you know, she's Iranian. So anything you look at, arts, music, business, uh, engineering, anything like that, you can actually find someone who represents your identity in a way. And though they do not speak for all Iranians, that's one way that you can actually begin to uh, at least progress within your own field. Uh, but I definitely urge people to find communities but also find communities where you can relate. To be honest, an Iranian uh, student, as an Iranian student in college, um, I didn't really have a single Iranian who went to my college. But I met a woman, a girl from El Salvador, and she also could not go back to her country. And she also had experienced a lot of similarities that I had felt and that my family had felt. So don't think that we're only limited to our own identity to find common ground. We can actually use our experiences to, to grow with, with other cultures as well. Uh, as an outsider to Iranian culture, how would you go about respecting the culture? Because as an Indian, Iran, Persian has been the lingua franca of India for 700 years until 1837. I, I was born in a city called Hyderabad. Abad is a Persian word which means city because Ab means water. If, you, if you're near a place of water, you're going to grow a city. And then the biggest build, well, most important building in Hyderabad is Charma. Anyone know what Char means in Persian? Four, right? Char in Hindi is four. Hindi would do. Menor, Minaret. So, I just, I feel in a strange place being here, like, trying to, I don't know, like, how do you relate to another culture when you feel like you're outside? And at what point do you have a stake in the culture? Is it disrespectful to assume that you can be a part of the culture? Or? Uh, actually, when I ask this question, what is to be Iranian? And what does it mean to have Iranian culture? Part of that is related to this question. Uh, for Iranians, for example, Shahnameh, this epic book of kings, which has the history of the original uh, ancient Iran, is really the ultimate expression of Iranian identity and culture. 
But if you read that book, most of the events which are happening, Iranian heroes and, and so on, are, are either in the present Afghanistan, or in the present Tajikistan, or in different uh, places which right now are, are not part of Iran as we know it right now. And this is a very important point. Iran has varieties of levels of meaning. And it's in, in its very rich history, it's one of the most important ancient civilizations of the world, probably the first real empire in the history of humanity. Iran has been consisting of varieties of places and varieties of languages and varieties of ethnicities and so on. Right now, we have a particular map of Iran. But Iran, in one sense, refers to anything within this territory. But in another sense, it refers to so many other cultures. And a lot of things about India is related to, to Iran. Uh, and the greatness of Iran, whenever Iran was the greatest, that was the moment that Iran became a, an occasion for interaction of different cultures, and it internalized all those cultures. Cyrus the Great did that. And Cyrus the Great, uh, with the centrality of the beautiful message of Zoroastrianism, and the, uh, the, the Mitraism and so on, the beautiful indigenous cultures of Iran, it uh, created a moment for interaction of different cultures, uh, which influenced and created a much richer culture. After the conquest of Iran by Islam for three centuries, that also became an occasion for interactions of various cultures. Iranians were the ones who created Islamic philosophy, Islamic sciences, and so on. And they created that out of Indian mysticism, which Sufism, you know, a, a lot of that is reflection of that. The Greek philosophy, what we call Islamic philosophy is to a large extent Greek philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, and the like, which was taken and became part of Iranian discourse and the like. So for me, it is very important when we have a concept of Iranian culture and identity, we go beyond these racist ideas that Arabs are not Iranian or are inferior, that Afghans, Afghans are not Iranians and so on, Tajiks are not this and so on, to be a real Iranian in the sense that I talked about, recognizing the dignity of all Iranians and all cultural expressions also requires a loving understanding of all different cultures, respect for all human cultures, and recognizing within us and within Iran the entire humanity. And the rich history of Iranian culture actually provides the possibility for going beyond chauvinistic nationalism and realizing that we all humans are one and the same. And therefore, unity in diversity means a unity in our diversity. Unity in diversity is the way that we have to go. the time for the program, but since everyone has such great questions, I'm sure we're going to see how many questions we can get done in the next 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, we'll close the program. You can feel free to stay, maybe get the contact info of one of the panelists if you have a question, but um, panelists, you're all geniuses, it's obvious, but um, if you could keep your, question, your answers a little bit shorter so we can make sure everybody gets a chance to um, ask their question or have it answered in some form. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, this is very informative. And I, I wanted to go to um, a couple of different points and sort of put them together and then ask my question. But with respect to America being very polarized right now and being divided and everything going on there, with our culture inherently having a lot of division in it um, due to, you know, 40, maybe hundreds of years. Um, and, and with respect to social media as well. Um, you know, none of these like propaganda, active measures, divide and conquer, none of these things are new concepts. 
uh, these have been going on. It's just the medium that's being used is different now. Uh, with respect to, you know, the, the types of things that are dividing Americans, I think that we could also be targets as Iranians, as, Amer as Iranian Americans, not just as far as, you know, within our own group, because it's just, you know, there's bad actors and chaos agents everywhere spreading misinformation that could divide people into just tiny, tiny little pieces so that that's what you can conquer. Um, but also, you know, turning, spreading information, disinformation, I should say, about Iranians and Iranian Americans to the greater American community. And I'm curious to see, like, from a social media perspective, there's troll farms from everywhere. It's not just Russia. There's Saudi, there's Iranians. So like, how do we get, well, my first question, how do we get, how do we determine what's fact and go through that? And secondly, like, what are your, do you have any suggestions on combating um, that type of division with us and about us? Um, regrettably, we're in a post-fact era and, uh, <laughs> The, we don't. I don't think we have the tools or resources yet on how to do this because we're, we've entrusted the dissemination of facts to media companies, both traditional and modern, both social media. We can't even agree on whether or not um, YouTube, as, as owned by Google, is a media platform or a tech platform or an entertainment platform. So until we, we don't really have the vocabulary or the muscles yet to understand how to treat sources of information and to distinguish that from disinformation. So, um, and I think that um, we, it's not, we haven't been able to keep up with, with where politics is going. So I think we're, we're behind on that. I think it's a matter of just figuring out what that is going to be. Until then, I don't know what the answer to that is. And it's a great question. <coughs> it's a very uh, urgent question. I just wanted to turn the panel around, if okay. We have so many young people in the audience. I'm just wondering how do they see their Iranian identity? Uh, what do you see the future um, of your Iranian identity as you move on with your life? You get married, uh, probably with someone from a different culture, and you have children. Uh, I just want to, if possible, Turn the panel around and make our youth our panelists and see what you guys think. Anyone wants to take on that challenge? You want to? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Um, I think I honestly was like starting to lose hope just growing up and seeing people be ashamed of their culture and like Iranians specifically. Um, but something like, just look around, look how many young people are here right now staying for the Q&A and genuinely interested in this. And I'm sure they're all like, they feel some sort of empowerment in themselves and some sort of like strong identity. And just talking like with my friends and even my cousins, I, I think there's a lot of hope. And I think even if we marry outside of our communities, there's still going to be that strong culture that we're going to be able to pass them. Um, so basically, I think there's a lot of hope in us appreciating our own uh, cultures as well as our kids because um, uh, from like when I was little, you know, I used to live in Reno and yeah, I was just surrounded by white people all the darn time. but. Every time I would come home and be with my grandparents and my mom, I realized that those were actually the times when I had the most fun and the times when I really felt like myself. And I just kept thinking, man, I never want to lose that part of myself. You know, I just, I love being unique and I feel like if I never had this part, I wouldn't be as fun as I am. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists, first of all. Um, I had a 
quick question. Dr. Shai, did you get mistaken for Larry David? <laughs> <laughs> you look exactly like Larry David. Um, and my real question is, so I had a conversation with my dad uh, about a year or so ago, and I said, like, you know, my, my Persian kind of sucks, and I kind of don't feel Iranian, because I, I feel like I can't communicate in the language of, of Iran. And I guess I'm probably not the only one who feels that way. Um, convince me that, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't feel that way, I guess. And How many people here feel uncomfortable in communicating in Farsi? Do you feel that you're Iranian? Raise your hand if you, while you don't feel comfortable, you still feel Iranian. There you go. You're not alone. It's, it's not anybody's fault. It's a very difficult question. As someone growing up, very proud to speak, read, and write my language fluently and have a child, I have the cards, I did part. Like, it is hard. It is a hard language. My daughter's learning more Spanish than she is. I mean, she understands fluently, but to speak, it's a difficult language. And, um, and she still, when she heard me respond to my mom in English, in English, she asked, why aren't you speaking our language? And five years old. So it is still very much part of you, even if you don't have the, uh, you know, the resume of what someone might say makes defines your Iranianness. That's why we're stuck. Luckily, we have the greatest Persian language instructor on the West Coast. Uh, sitting here. Um, <laughs> Contribute so much 
Absolutely, thank you. Next up, question? Coming for you. And can I also see hands of who else is left? Okay, so um, my question is um, in regards to, because um, we talk a lot about the Iranian identity, um, but what I see a lot when um, the Iranians come here is they suddenly um, are suddenly, they, they ignore religion or even more of that are pushed away from religion. And so, um, and I've, I personally have found that like um, having, realizing you're, that you're human, and that like you can't control everything, and that like um, you have to have faith in something um, is very essential to um, living here. So my my question is, um, uh, what role do you think we should uh, parents and as parents or as just Iranians should we play in like um, teaching our children on how to approach religion or faith? And um, like for example, if like a, a lot of Iranians that come here. They no longer, you know, like they don't pray five times a day if they were Muslim or stuff like this. Um, and a lot of, uh, I know a lot of parents would even sometimes shun their kids for uh, thinking of a different religion or something like that. So, um, what, how should um, 